Hey everyone, David here with your weekly Mouthful of David video. Uh, like usual, we'll start with the updates on the podcast. So we just dropped our second of two parts about Vladimir Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, after that will be our two-parter about boxing heavyweight champions, where we'll basically look at different heavyweight champions from the past and talk about not just their own life stories, but kind of what makes them historically and... Uh, sociologically interesting so be on the lookout for that after that we'll be doing another movie episode and then uh after that we'll we'll see what happens so uh we got some cool stuff coming up but for this week i i started working again at ucsd for the making of the modern world program for those of you who haven't heard of it before which is probably like the overwhelming majority of you uh it's basically like a world history slash writing class and so i've been TAing it for three years now. I'm just starting the third year. And uh, it's got me kind of busy right now, so I figured I'd just do uh, an episode this week kind of related to it. But it's also one that I kind of think about a lot anyway, so I think it's worth uh, discussing regardless. And that is the benefit of studying things that aren't in your immediate area of interest. Because for me personally, uh, my, my degree, my history MA, is in uh, post-Civil War U.S. history and then also 20th century revolutionary and counter-revolutionary uh, Latin American history. Those are my two areas of specialty. So when I'm learning and, you know, TAing for uh, older world history, because long story short, uh, the way the program works is people who aren't graduate students at UCSD, like myself, we usually just get hired for the earlier sequences in the course. So we're TAing for, like, early human history... Uh, an ancient history, medieval history, early modern, stuff like that. And that is stuff completely outside of both my expertise and my normal area of interest, right? But as I've TA'd there for the last couple years, I've actually grown pretty into some of the stuff that I've learned. Um, and I think part of it is because when you learn something new, it gives you new perspective on stuff that you already did know. You know, it gives you new points of comparison and contrasting and it's actually really interesting uh an example i use is you know you study the decline of empires different empires from throughout human history right you study the fall of the roman empire you study the fall of you know various empires in india china uh whatever your, your area of interest is and studying those things can really help shed light on the present now, for me personally, like, one common thread that I've noticed between, you know, any declining empires, whether it was Rome or a certain period in China or even in the modern, is, you know, decentralization, where you have these uh, private forces that accumulate a lot of power and authority uh, away from a, a central authority, usually the state. And so... You know, you saw that in Rome with the rise of the Latifundia creating their landed estates, which, which eventually led to feudalism. And I think you can kind of draw a parallel like that to the U.S. and the rise of multinational corporations that, you know, have no real loyalty to the U.S. and are just kind of draining resources and wealth away and kind of just hoarding it for themselves um, and all that. But... That's just my analysis, uh, but the grander point here is that that's not necessarily a parallel to other parts of human history and the human experience that I would have made if I weren't studying these other periods in human history. And another thing that's pretty cool is you get exposed to different ideas that you wouldn't know about just studying your own sort of normal uh, topics of interest. Uh, one thing that I found super interesting, an ideology that I found cool, has been uh, Confucianism. I don't subscribe to a lot of it, especially how hierarchical it is, but I do think there are some really cool ideas in there. Uh, obviously, at its most base, uh, when you're treating other people the Ren, which is a uh, term for like humanity and empathy, kind of. Um, I think that's a, a great foundation upon uh, which to base your interactions with other people. You know, uh, Confucius had the five uh, defining relationships that he listed uh, as as a, another underpinning of his philosophy. 
which, you know, again, I don't love hierarchy that much, uh, but I do like that he talked about the mutual responsibility of both parties, both the person with more and less power in those relationships. You know, during his day, um, you know, the the people in charge basically ruled only thinking about power. So that, that did bring a little bit more of a balance uh, to, to China uh, when his ideas started gaining ground, which, of course... Took a while because people in power didn't want to be told, "Hey, treat your subjects with uh, with empathy and and mutual respect." You know, they don't just respect you; you respect them back. So, you know, some some cool ideas there. Uh, again, I definitely would not call myself Confucian uh, if, for you know, no other reason, I don't live in uh, a society where that's an immediately pressing like philosophy that relates to our everyday lives. But cool ideas. Uh, you know, finally, another thing that you can benefit from, uh, studying, you know, other, again, other areas that aren't inside your normal area of interest is you, you kind of understand how connected we are as humans. And it sounds really cheesy, I know, but you get to see how things that you might've assumed were, I don't know, let's be real here, right? Like, Things that you might assume, oh, it's this like modern invention. Clearly, it traces back to Europe, uh, because that's sort of the underpinning of how we're taught often in K through twelve. Um, you might learn that a certain invention came from India or from China or from you know some other some other place. Um, for example, in what we would call the Middle East right now, a lot of the Greek classics were only preserved because people in the Middle East preserved them because they were super literate, and a lot more tolerant than Europe uh, during what Europe called the Dark Ages. And we wouldn't have those things without them having preserved it. And not only did they preserve a lot of ancient Greek knowledge, but they actually built on it too. You know, during the uh, early part of the first millennia, I guess you would call it, you know, like the, the, the year 1000, 1100, 1200, you know, in that kind of span of time, uh, there were incredible innovations in architecture and art, science, math, just a whole bunch of different subjects, uh, that were accomplished in the Middle East. And a lot of those accomplishments, uh, basically came over to Europe and other parts of the world. And, it was on the bedrock of those foundations that, you know, Europeans came up with some of their own inventions during the Renaissance. Uh, and that's not to locate, uh, you know, the Middle East as the foundation of everything either, though, because the Middle East was also getting stuff from Africa, from China, from India, from all these other places. So it's, it's this really interconnected web that you really get to appreciate when you learn more about world history. So, you know... Even if you have your own subjects that you're really into, I'd highly encourage you to check out other places. It's really good for your growth uh, as a person, as a scholar, as a historian. And yeah, just uh, just check out other things. Even if it's, you know, watching a YouTube video about uh, ancient Chinese history or reading an article about Greek history, something like that, you know. You don't have to become an expert, but just kind of dipping your toes in other places is cool. Anyways, thanks for listening, everyone. Have a good week, and catch you next time.